we are rolling. I've got my positive mental attitude shirt on. We're ready to tackle the coronavirus one day at a time. Guys, we're starting chapter two, um, and appropriately it is named Starting Over. Now, we are not talking about starting over the school year. We're actually talking about starting over. We, remember, the last unit we talked about immigrants, the push factors and the pull factors. Why are being, people being pushed out of their native countries? Why are people being pulled into this new country, this America? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read periodically. I'm going to stop and we will discuss. Well, no, we're not really going to discuss. I'm going to talk uh, and give you some notes. We can't really discuss unless you guys want to, you know, email me. Okay. Uh, Google Classroom, I'm going to turn on chat so we can discuss things. All right. So here we are. Chapter two, starting over. Difficult voyage. Before beginning life in America, nearly all immigrants first had to endure the hardships of an ocean voyage. Sailing to America in the early 1800s was not as risky as it had been in colonial times, but it was hardly a pleasure cruise. The voyage lasted anywhere from one to three months, depending on wind and weather. The sailing ships on which they traveled were usually made for carrying freight. In other words, they weren't being used for passengers. Ship owners made good money simply by putting 50 bunk beds into a huge airless room below deck and selling tickets to the immigrants, often as many as 250 or more, who would take turns using the bunk beds. Stinky. On good days, passengers could walk above deck and enjoy the fresh sea air. On bad or simply cold days, though, they stayed below decks, breathing the same stale air and getting very seasick. On many ships, passengers were expected to provide their own food and prepare it on a single large stove shared by everyone. Those who failed to bring enough food might buy some from the ship's captain. Do you think he's going to charge uh, small prices for that, or do you think he's going to gouge them? I'm pretty sure he's going to raise the prices. Otherwise, they had to get along on what they had brought and on whatever amount of drinking water that the captain could provide. Where did the immigrants first set foot in America? Well, that depended on where their captain's ship was going. Most of the freight ships obvious... Let's see, that's what happens when you're making a YouTube video and you don't pay attention at the time. Most of the uh, freight ships did business on the East Coast, places like New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore. That is where most of the European immigrants first landed. But a large number traveled on freighters bound for New Orleans. For them, that city was their introduction to America. Many immigrants planned from the beginning to move on from the port where they landed, just where they would uh, move depended on a number of things. First, those things included the city that they arrived in, the amount of money that was going to be in their pockets when they got there, their skills, and especially the locations where the others of their nationality had already settled. I mean, if you think about it, um, if you go to even New York City today, mostly it's gone, but it still exists to a certain point. You have pockets of ethnicities in um, major cities, especially in New York City. You have my, maybe Little Italy or Little um, little Greece, Little Odessa, which is Russian. And these places are um, almost like welcoming uh, for these new immigrants coming in because, hey, there's somebody else that's like me. I want to be with them. Okay, um, I'm from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, so there's a lot of Irish there. A lot of people who are coming in from Ireland Hey, who am I going to hang out with? A bunch of people who I have nothing in common with or people uh, from my native country. Of course, they're going to choose the people from their native country, mostly. And also, something else, too, is if you have a skill, okay? If you were a skilled laborer and you worked in cotton mills, you would go to the areas that had most of the mills that provided cotton uh, or cotton products, like Massachusetts, like New England area. If you were a coal miner, you probably went to Pennsylvania at that time because there were a lot of coal mines in Pennsylvania. 
So um, you would you would pick like um, areas that would match your skills. Many immigrants planned uh, from the beginning to move on from the port that they landed just uh, where they would have depended on a number of those things. Uh, these things included the city that, I already read that, sorry. Um, some immigrants owned small farms in their homelands, which they managed to sell before leaving. That gave them some money to buy farmland in America, preferably in a climate that they were used to. So after arriving, they made their way to places where they could farm. More than half the German immigrants who arrived during these years before the Civil War entered the United States through New Orleans. Well, what empties out in New Orleans? The Mississippi River. So a lot of them are going to get on, on river boats and go north. Okay, And as they go north, many of them, too, uh, came with enough money to buy farmland. Most of them made their way up the Mississippi and carved out farms in Missouri, Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Immigrants with special work skills often went uh, where there was a demand for those work skills. A Welsh coal miner, for example, would head over to the coal mines in eastern Pennsylvania. Someone who worked in or uh, one of the British textile factories would go somewhere in the northeast. And, of course, it was natural for immigrants to settle where relatives, friends, and other people were already living. Living among their own made their adjustment to America much easier. Imagine if you're speaking a foreign language and you move to, a, 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 you move to the United States and you, maybe you speak German. Well, around a bunch of people who were English speakers, that would be difficult. So, if you were living in a community where there were other German speakers, it would, uh, life would be a lot more, um, uh, it would be a lot easier uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, remaining in the cities, a good number of immigrants who came in this wave of immigration in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, though uh, they remained in the cities where they landed. Does that seem surprising to you? After all, hadn't most of those people been farmers? And for them, wasn't the promise of America about plentiful land? Yeah, uh, for the most part, but not all. And about one out of every five who arrived before the Civil War was a skilled worker um, who had lived in a town or in a city in Europe. But that still leaves four, the other four out of that five, right? They included cabinet makers, tailors, carpenters, weavers, shoemakers, printers, bookbinders. Those were still uh, those were still the days before machines replaced most of those skills. Skilled workers settled in American cities because they had a skill. As for the other four-fifths, the other 80%, who had made their living from the farm, most were far too poor to buy a farm when they arrived. In fact, they were too poor to even uh, to travel beyond the cities where they had landed. They had to find work quickly. Without skills, they had nothing to sell but their muscle power and their time. They took whatever work they could get at whatever pay that they were offered. Cities had plenty of jobs that, um, that needed doing. There were streets that needed to be swept, ships that needed to be loaded and unloaded, stables to be cleaned, garbage and trash to be hauled, ditches to be dug, heavy loads to be carried. And in the 1850s, there were thousands of such jobs in New York City alone, and most of them were held by immigrants. Uh, another kind of job open to immigrant women would be, uh, in these cities, would be domestic work, that is, working as a maid or a house cleaner. Now, these are all what we would call unskilled labor positions. You don't have to be trained to be a sweeper. To be a weaver, yes, you do. So those jobs were much more um, uh, welcoming, much high, higher pay, but anybody could basically uh, do a lot of those low unskilled labor positions and these people that are coming into the country that have no money, that have no skill, what are you going to do? You're going to pick up a broom or you're going to carry off trash is what you're going to do. Um, of all of the immigrants, the Irish were the poorest. And in that last unit, we talked about that. Many had worked on the land in Ireland and, and so did not have other specific skills. Irish men often hired themselves out to work on construction of railroads, canals, and other projects in the West. In later years, Chinese, Mexican, and Italian laborers provided the muscle power 
that built America's railroads. But in this earlier period, before the 1860s, much of that work was performed by the Irish. Some of the Irish who worked in the railroad gangs settled in these railroad cities, such as Albany, Buffalo, Cleveland, Chicago. These workers were the start of large Irish communities in these places. But of course, it was not the Irish alone who filled America's cities. French Canadians, that's me, I'm a French Canadian, moved into the cotton mills uh, in the towns of New England, and large numbers of Germans settled in New York, Connecticut, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, New York, Cincinnati, Milwaukee, and St. Louis. And there were English immigrants scattered among a number of America's growing cities. Immigrant life in the cities. Living conditions for most immigrants in the cities were simply dreadful. In the 1850s, investigators did a study of the housing in New York City. Just read the description of uh, one building where 70 Irish immigrants lived. Tiny little building. They were called tenement houses. Um, there is a three-story building over a stable where an express company's horses are kept. The dilapidation of this, oh, by the way, dilapidation means just like run-down conditions, okay? Uh, of this entire building is extreme. Its rickety floors tread, uh, shook under the tread in portions of the wall, black and mildewed, were continually breaking off. A poor woman who occupied an apartment on the second floor complained of the old ceiling. It, um, it's, the old ceiling is as old as myself, and it's full of uh, hmm, drop, it is. I think what she's referring to here is mildew and, and dampness and wetness within the ceiling and in the walls, meaning it was soaked, well, there you go, uh, meaning it was soaked with water and entered through the broken roof whenever it would rain. After such a rain, the investigators discovered the upper floors of the tenement were completely flooded and the people had to move their drenched beds from one spot to another. They crowd, uh, how crowded were they? In one of the rooms uh, of the front house, an apartment six feet by ten feet in area, a window, uh, a, a widow lived with her five children, six people in that room. One has to wonder what kind of American letter uh, such a person would have written to family and friends back home in Ireland. One area in New York City stands out the most of all. It was part of Lower Manhattan, known as the Five Points. The Five Points was so cramped, dangerous, and unhygienic that it became notorious. Charles Dickens and Abraham Lincoln visited the Five Points and spoke out of the conditions. The neighborhood before the Civil War was made up mostly of Irish immigrants, then later Germans, Italians, European Jews, and African Americans lived there. It is said that out of this mix of cultures became a phenomenon of American tap dancing. And yet, it is important to remember that while the lives of many immigrants were hard, that was not true for everyone, obviously. Those who came as skilled laborers generally had fewer problems adjusting to America. They were soon paid as well as skilled laborers uh, that were born in America, and they were far better off than though they had been in Europe. The same was true for hundreds of thousands who took up farming, especially for those immigrants who were able to buy up their own farmland. For such persons, America truly was a land of opportunity. Those who struggled were mostly the poor and the unskilled, who were crowded into the cities and who lived in dreadful conditions. However, despite these hardships, they believed they had one thing in America that they did not have before, a future for themselves and for their children. That was why they scrimped and saved to bring over every family member that they could. Every time an immigrant purchased a, sh a, sh a ship ticket to send a relative back home, he was casting a vote for America. Okay, so that is going to be the end of chapter two starting over. Um, the living conditions were very poor. Um, the, the section where they talked about the five points, there's a good book by a guy by the name of Herbert Asbury. He wrote a book about the gangs of New York City and a lot of the violence during this time between the different um, uh, cultures, between the different groups. 
Um, if you had a grudge in Europe, what's to stop you from having that same grudge when you came to this new world? Um, please uh, look at my Google Classroom. I have a set of questions for you to answer from this reading. Check it out, answer your questions. You have all the way until Friday to answer them, but get those done so we can get our online lessons going. I'm gonna put another video on tomorrow. Pay attention to it, listen, and we will do a great job together. Thank you, bye.